Hello and welcome back to History for Atheists. My guest today is the historian of science, Tony Christie. Tony is an independent scholar based in Germany and he's also the author of the superb Renaissance Mathematicus blog. Since 2009, Tony has been posting weekly on the history of science in the early modern period. His knowledge of this topic is absolutely vast and he, like me, gets rather grumpy at pseudo-historical myths, especially the ones associated with Galileo. Since the Galileo affair is a topic that's often brought up in discussions about the history of science generally, and the relationship between science and religion in particular, Tony is the perfect person to give us a detailed overview of what happened, and more importantly, what did not happen in the dispute between Galileo and the Catholic Church. Tony and I spoke for almost two and a half hours on this subject, so I've edited our conversation into three parts of about 50 minutes each. In this, the first part, we discuss the common myths that seem to be accepted by many people and certainly by many atheists about what happened in the Galileo affair. Tony gives a detailed background to Galileo's early career and the social and scientific context in which he worked. In part two, we discuss Galileo's key astronomical discoveries, and then in part three, the causes of the controversy around his most famous book and his 1633 trial by the Inquisition. So sit back and enjoy this tour of 16th and early 17th century science with my guest, Tony Christie. Tony Christie, welcome uh, to History for Atheists, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation about Galileo, but just to, to bring us into that conversation, I was reading online yesterday in preparation for this uh, for this conversation with you, and I, I thought I'd go to uh, a, a Reddit group devoted to to atheists, and I typed in the search term Galileo, and here's what I discovered about Galileo. Apparently, Galileo was the father of science. Apparently, he was in many ways the first ever scientist. Uh, apparently, he proved that the earth went around the sun and uh, apparently the church rejected his scientific proof, refused to look through his telescope and, and uh, imprisoned him, tortured him, in some cases even burned him at the stake because they hated science. But he was right and they were wrong and the church took until 1992 to finally get around to apologising for, uh, for, for uh, oppressing him or perhaps burning him. How accurate is that picture of, of Galileo that I picked up by reading uh, Atheists Online yesterday? Um, let's put it this way. Um, the only bit of it that's halfway true is 1992, <laughs> um, which is when the point where the um, Pope announced the decision of the commission that had been set up to investigate the Galileo affair and basically said, well, what we did was not right. Um, and that's about as far as it got. Um, uh, the rest of it's rubbish. Um, okay. there's, there's a sort of, can I, uh, if, we, if we look at Galileo, um, if you ask people who's the most famous scientist, um, these days you'll get an answer, you'll get some sort of television personality, you'll get, uh, if it's Americans, they'll say Neil deGrasse Tyson, if it's Brits, they'll say uh, Brian Cox. I have no idea what the Australian equivalent of that is, but they're, 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 they're te television personalities, not really practising scientists. Uh, maybe David Attenborough, who's not even a scientist. I mean, Brian Cox at least was a scientist, is a scientist. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson was at one point in his life an astronomer uh, or an astrophysicist or something, um, hasn't been for a long time. Um, but if you, if, you, if you press it and say, well, who is a famous scientist? Who is the most famous scientist? And you usually get three people. Named, interestingly, they're all physicists. Um, that's Galileo, um, Newton and Einstein. You might get Darwin thrown into the mix. Um, and that's about it. Um, but if you then ask them um, what they know about Galileo, um, what they will tell you is 50% legend, 50% myth, and 100% bullshit. <laughs> and it's what's interesting, you'll get almost exactly the same proportions about Newton or Einstein. Um, the bigger, the, the more important, the bigger the figure historically, um, the less truth in, in the popular image of that person. Um, and Galileo suffers immensely from this. Um, 
the, the myth that the Galileo, that the people that think they know about, was created end of the 18th beginning of the 19th century um as you as you well know there was the sort of this uh um thesis from from various american um university or, or college professors who, who who invented this war between um science and and, and religion yeah. and galileo became became the, the 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 main uh witness for the prosecution um and they created they they created the galileo myths um he wasn't that important um in the 18th century or after his death in the 17th century as a scientist um so it's very difficult um because even even books and the trouble is most of the books on galileo are written by philosophers not historians and what they do is that galileo is immensely readable immensely readable he's one of the greatest writers in the history of science he's a brilliant polemicist and they read Galileo but they don't do the science they don't do the background they don't look at it in context they read Galileo straight uh, like they read they take his book they'll take something like I, I've got it in one of the translations in front of me the two new sciences um, they'll take it and they'll read it and they, 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 they'll, they'll try to create their picture of what's happening um, just by reading Galileo they don't read the rest. I mean, it's just they don't look at it in context because they're so, not so historians, they're, they're philosophers. So they're literally basing it on one side of the argument because there was an argument. And, so, and secondly, yeah. they're basing it on, on, the, on the writings of a guy who was very good at promoting his side of the argument. He was a great polemicist. I mean, living and aside you, you, whatever you have, it was. You the have this, in the 17th century, you have the same thing with, with Francis Bacon. Yeah. Bacon's influence on the on, on the history of science is much much smaller than most people think, and most of what he said was wrong. Uh, but he's a brilliant writer, right. and he even he even wrote a science fiction story, you know, and everybody thinks he's wonderful. Um, so he gets he gets bigged up by the philosophers, and the philosophers originally wrote uh, history of science. Philosophy of science was 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 is much older than history of science in the modern context. Um, so you've got the philosophers in the 19th century are writing the history of science. And they tend to read the people who can write the philosoph who can write philosophically, like Galileo, like Bacon, um, to a lesser extent, Newton. Um, and they build their story around this. Yeah. And so, so, very so, so if, if Galileo was elevated, if we could say it that way, in yeah. the 19th century, as a result Late 18th, of, late as 18th, a result, 18th, early 18th 19th century. century. As a result, in, in terms of the, the modern conception of him, in, in large part of the, the Drake or White thesis, that's yeah. the, the conflict thesis, the idea that, that science and religion has always been a war, which arose in the in the 1870s to 1890s. Um, maybe if we can go back and have a look at, if you can tell us about Galileo's reputation in his time, in, in the in the early 17th century, what was what was his standing? In, in that period? Well, I, one thing that most people don't realise um, is that Galileo was also already a fairly old middle-aged man before anybody really knew he existed. Um, he was a, he, he was a uh, North Italian academic. He didn't have a degree. Um, he got to be a professor on the basis of his um, abilities and on personal recommendations. Interesting enough, um, he got his first job on the recommendation of a um, cardinal uh, of the Catholic Church, um, who was the house cardinal of the, of the Medicis, um, uh, uh, Del Monte. Um, and Guibaldo Del Monte was one of the, the leading sort of mathematical engineer physicists at the time, and his brother was the... Um, the Medici um, cardinal and Galileo sent his his his, his stuff um, his mathematical stuff um, to Del Monte to Guibaldo, Guibaldo um, and uh, he he sort of said to his brother, "Oh, this guy's good. You've got to give him professorship in Pisa." So um, so so the it's, idea it's, so, so the idea that that the Catholic Church was made up entirely of superstitious idiots who hated science and had no scientific knowledge is clearly nonsense, given that. Galileo was being recommended to buy a cardinal who was highly scientifically uh, literate. One, one of the things that, that, that really annoys me 
um, is the fact that people sort of say, well, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's the Jesuits. Um, they, they, they had it in for, for Galileo. Um, and they're, they're completely anti-science. Um, the leading mathematical scholars of the period are all Jesuits. Um, right. Mathematics played no really major role in the uh, medieval university. Um, nominally, quadrivium, um, arithmetic, geometry, um, music, astronomy, uh, was part of the uh, undergraduate course at university, liberal arts course, um, but wasn't actually taught very much. If it was taught, it was taught at a very low level. Um, the um, arithmetic was uh, Boethius, which is this sort of uh, one on one is two and sort of stuff like this. Um, I, no joke. I mean, really, no joke. Um, <laughs> I've read it. Yeah. The, the music was 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 also Boethius, um, and in, in mathematical terms, is is the theory of proportions because um, length of strings, um, you know, sort of double the length of string, you get an octave and all the rest of it. Um, it's Pythagoras. Um, Geometry, they did the, if they did at all, um, they did the six books of, uh, the first six books of Euclid. Um, but in fact, very often they didn't get much past the first book. And uh, astronomy was um, Sacrobosco, which is, which is a sort of non-technical um, introduction to geocentric uh, astronomy. Um, and, and that's it. I mean, that's the, that's the mathematics taught at the medieval university. I mean, don't forget that, Galileo went were taught at a medieval university. Was still the university system is still medieval at the beginning of, at the end of the sixteenth, beginning of the seventeenth century. Was that was that um, or Verona? I'm trying to remember. He was he was at Pisa at the beginning. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. um, and then went to Padua. Yeah. Um, again, on the recommendation of Del Monte, on the recommendation of, and that's the point, Christoph Clavius. Um, who was the uh, professor of mathematics for the Jesuits at the Collegio Romano, which is now the Jesuit University in, in, in Rome. Um, and and, and in, this, in this period, mathematics included astronomy, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, astronomy is, is, is a branch of mathematics. Um, and one of the people who changed this um, for, the, for the Catholic Church was Clavius. Um, the Jesuits set up a, a major education program. Their argument was that they're counter-reformation. Uh, and their argument is we can't defeat the reformers um, just by telling them that they're wrong. We have to have the better arguments. <laughs> so they, 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 they set up an education program to, to teach their own people and to teach Catholics better knowledge and better methods of arguing than the Protestants. We're going, to, we're going to beat them on the intellectual level. And this is the whole point of the, of the Jesuit education program. And originally it's, it's, it's very Thomist. Um, it's very Aristotelian Thomist um, sort of medieval stuff, but modernized. And there's no mathematics in it really. And Clavius comes along. Clavius is the professor of mathematics at the Collegio Romano. And so I said, we need a major mathematics program. And various people in the Jesuits say, no, we don't. So Clavius fought a sort of 10 year war and one, and got mathematics installed in, in, in all of the um, Jesuit schools and colleges throughout Europe. And, and by the early 17th century, there, there, there are literally tens of thousands of them. And he ran a, a teacher training scheme. Um, so he taught the first generation of teachers himself, wrote the textbooks, um, and basically introduced modern mathematics for that period, modern mathematics in, in, into the Catholic uh, curriculum. Yeah. And he's, he's, he's doing this. And Galileo goes to uh, Clavius the same way he went to uh, Guibaldoldo and, and uh, Del Monte and says, hey, uh, can you recommend me? You know, like sort of, I'm, I'm a mathematician. I'm quite good. You know, sort of. And but wasn't, wasn't said, Galileo originally taught mathematics by Jesuits? Um, not really, no. Um, oh, okay. he, he, he was taught by, by a private tutor, I forgot his name, uh, uh, Richie, I think. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, he, he originally went to university in, 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 in Pisa um, to study medicine because um, his father wanted him to have a good career. But didn't get uh, a degree he, in the He end. dropped out. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he didn't like it. <laughs> and he took private mathematics uh, lessons by this guy um, who, who had a good reputation as a mathematician. And 
word got around that he was pretty good. Um, and that's when he started getting in contact with people like Del Monte and, and, and Clavius. He wrote a couple of papers, um, one of them on, on, on his, his theories about what, in fact, um, Archimedes had done when he was, he was measuring up whether the crown was gold or not. He, he, he introduced a new... No, he, he looked at the physics of it and said the traditional story can't work. Can't work. Um, yeah. How did it really work? Um, and invented a, a, a hydraulic um, scales, um, a theoretical one. Um, and that was his, and, and that impressed Del Monte and it impressed Clavius. Yeah. And they recommended him, it's sort of they gave him references to get the university jobs. But Clavius set up this, this whole um, academic, for the, for, uh, academic mathematics thing for the, for the um, Catholic education system. And interesting enough, in, in, in the Collegio Romano, he set up an, an advanced institute for mathematics. And he had some very, very good people working there. Like sort of, he, he selected all the best um, Jesuit mathematicians he could find. And they were, they were running research programs and doing the rest of it. So they are the most advanced mathematicians in Europe at the time. So, so, not, super, so not super specific to- So uh, this is, this is not anti-science in any way whatsoever. It's the exact opposite, <laughs> uh, which is why Galileo, uh, Turned to, to Clavius, you know, because like, he knew where he knew where the the, 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 the people in the nowhere yeah. were. Um, he then, he, as I say, he went to Pisa um, as professor of mathematics. Um, basically, got thrown out because um, he's um, always been a, a, um, a clever asshole um, <laughs> and enjoyed taking the piss out of people. And whatever you say about Galileo, he was incredibly intelligent. The impression I get is that he was a very, very smart guy. He loved an argument. And, uh, and he was, and as you say, he was very, good at, very good at taking the piece and probably annoying people. He probably would have made uh, him a Twitter troll, I think. And he was he, he's a polymath. He was, he was a good mathematician. Um, he was a very good artist, yeah. uh, which played a role because uh, he, he, he was the first person to recognise that what he saw through the telescope was uh, on the surface of the moon was three-dimensional. And the theory is that because he'd been trained as an artist, he could recognize um, shadows and the rest of it. Um, he, then, he then went off to Padua, um, where he stayed for quite a long time. And he's just basically, he's a professor of mathematics. And, and you have to understand in the hierarchy of the, of, of the medieval university, uh, um, the professor of mathematics is at the very bottom of the heap. He's the, he's the least important person at university, uh, literally. Um, and some in, on some universities, probably the cleaning woman has more status than the professor of mathematics. And so Galileo said, but he, he establishes himself in intellectual circles in Padua as as a uh, good drinking companion, as a a wit, clever clogs. Um, he's, 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 he's 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 the soul of the uh, a boogieing. Um, but he's, 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 he's a nobody. He, he actually then gets a, job, a summer job, summer vacation job. Uh, the heir to the Medici's um, mathematics. Um, he's employed by the uh, Grand Duchess Christine, Christiana um, as, as math, math teacher to her um, son. As I say, um, he'd been in Padua for quite a long time, um, had a local reputation. Um, but that's about it. Had already done his stuff in, in mechanics with, with, with his ramps and his balls and the, the laws of fall, uh, but hadn't written it up and hadn't published it. Um, and then along comes the telescope. And there is some, uh, one of the oldest myths is that Galileo invented the telescope. That actually started in his own lifetime, um, that he claimed to have invented the telescope, which he denied. He said, I never made this claim. Um, and of course, he didn't invent the telescope. Um, the other one was that he, he vastly improved the telescope. Basically, his telescope is no different to the one that was invented by Lippe High in, in 1608. What it had was better lenses, um, different focal lengths. But a lot of other people had done that anyway. And what Galileo had done was not particularly spectacular or, or anything else. He sort of started, he, he was actually a very, very good astronomical observer. Uh, you can't deny that. He, he, he was an excellent astronomical observer. And he started doing basic sort of um, observations. He started doing his sketches of the moon and all the rest of it. And then he discovered the four moons of Jupiter. Um, 
Was this um, had, had he I already that point. at that stage had he already decided that he agreed with Copernicus, or, or was that what what got him to the to the point where he was uh, considered himself? Um, well, the interesting thing is that um, Kepler published in 1593, yep. uh, 1596, his uh, Mysterium Cosmographicum, which is a rather weird book um, in which he proves that the, the um, spaces between the um, six planets are the five uh, Euc regular Euclidean solids, uh, which is a brilliant piece of mathematics, but it's, it's sort of rather weird. Completely wrong. Um, <laughs> no, but... Um, it's 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 still um, and he the story is that he sent one to Galileo, which is complete rubbish. He didn't because he didn't know who Galileo was. Nobody knew who Galileo was. Um, what happens? He gave a friend who went on a tour of Italy. He gave him two copies uh, and said, "If you meet anybody interesting along the way who who might be interested in it, give him one." <laughs> so so his friend went all the way down to Rome. Um, and still had the books and was on his way back to Germany and he stopped off in Padua and suddenly realised he still had these two books and sort of went into the university and says, is there a professor of mathematics around here? Um, and sort of found Galileo and gave him the two books and said, yeah, like, you might be interested in this and sort of went on his way. Uh -huh. Galileo looks interesting. And she wrote a letter to Kepler um, thanking him for the books and saying that he had been a uh, he he had been a Copernican for a long time, but didn't talk about it in public. Um, and Kepler wrote back saying, well, "You should talk about it in public. We 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 we've got to we've got to promote uh, Copernicus." And that was the end of the correspondence. Um, what 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 year was that? didn't respond. What year was that? that was... This is sort of. Uh, this 15. is sort of towards the end of the end, end of the 16th century, 16th century yeah. uh, 50, around uh, 1600 or so, um, okay. maybe a bit earlier, um, and that was the end of the uh, correspondence. And Galileo didn't didn't respond to to, to Kepler's letter. Uh, Kepler describes this as there's a strange man uh, who's got uh, two names the same, because in Latin uh, Galileo Galileo is Galileus Galileus. <laughs> um, uh, that was that was the first sort of contact between the two of them, um, and Galileo had never really done anything very much about it um, in those terms at all. Um, he never really sort of said, "I'm Copernican" or "I'm a um, geocentric" or whatever. 1604, there was a um, Stella Nova. Uh, which uh, Galileo missed the beginnings of. Um, still an over uh, being what we would what we would call a, 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 a supernova. A supernova, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Kepler wrote a report on it. Wrote and published a report on it. Observed it. Um, Simon Marius and uh, another um, student in Simon Marius was a student at the time, and another student in Padua. Simon Marius was a student in Padua. Um, sort of basically took the piss out of Galileo because he he, he missed it, <laughs> and Galileo then held a series of lectures on it. Um, so he's starting to get because you, you have this thing about the um, the Nova is they disprove part of the Aristotelian cosmology, yeah. and what you what you have to understand most people don't realize people talk about there being a fixed. Um, astronomy. They, they sort of say geocentric astronomy, geocentric astronomy. Um, what you have as mainstream, and it's important, this is mainstream, there, is other, there are other versions, um, is an uneasy compromise between Aristotelian cosmology and Ptolemaic astronomy. And Uneasy compromise, well, one of the central uh, points of Aristotelian cosmology is that everything rotates around a common centre. It's homocentric. And the different epicycle model, epicycle model of uh, Ptolemaic astronomy contradicts this. Mm 
because they don't. I mean, the planets go around a little thing which goes around a thing which isn't centered on the Earth, and yeah. So it's, so, not, it's what it's what I often refer to as a as a series of mathematical kludges. It's basically, well, how do we maintain this idea generally? Sort well, of, it's it's with lots it's, of it's circular actually, orbits, but but still describe what's going on in the sky. It's it's it's, it's, it's interesting. Is it's, it's Fourier analysis. Um, you can reduce everything to to a set of uh, uh, circles. Um, and, and Fourier lived in the nineteenth century, so you know, sort of, it's just like they're way ahead of their time, boy. Um, and so you got this um, uneasy compromise, and all the way through the sixteenth century, um, people have been poking holes in Aristotelian uh, cosmology, because one of the central, another central uh, tenet of, uh, cosmology, of Aristotelian cosmology is that there's a difference between the um, sublunar region and the superlunar region. That's the the orbit of the moon di di divides the Earth from from outer space and Everything under the orbit of the moon um, consists of four elements. Um, it's a region which changes the whole time. Everything above the moon consists of one fifth element, the quintessence, which is literally the fifth element. Uh, most people don't realize the origin of this word. Um, the ether yep. is another. Yeah. Yep. And this is unchanging. Um, movement on the earth. Natural movement is vertical movement from uh, it's things fall down to the earth. All, all other forms of movement are unnatural movement. Um, and in the, the superlunar region, you only have natural movement and natural movement is circular. It's uniform circular motion. And if you actually look at the planets from the, they don't go around in uniforms. And trying to explain this, you produce various mathematical models. Um, the first one is with nested uh, spheres. Um, so you have one sphere going around that way and another one going around that way, which the one is inside the other, uh, in order to produce the variations in the planetary motions. And this is the model that, that um, Aristotle adopted. Um, in Aristotle, you end up with, I think it's 57 spheres um, um, to get it to work. Um, and... There, is, there are two other models which were developed by Apollonius, um, and they are the eccentric model that you, you just move a circle away from the center, and the other is the epicycle deferent model. And basically, um, Ptolemaic astronomy uses the epicycle deferent model, um, but modifies it in order to produce a uniform um, circular motion using equants and all that. We don't need to go into the details, but it, it, it's a fairly complex map. But it works. The it thing works. is, it actually works. It works because in, what the you're into that in the sense you can use it to work out where something is going to be in the sky yeah. at any given time. Um, all of, the, was, the, 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 was, the, was there an understanding that, that this couldn't possibly be what was really going on? And the reason I'm asking um, is, is, is I'm interested in whether Galileo thought that the Copernican model, which was in many ways also a series of mathematical kludges, because it, it involves circular orbits and the orbits aren't circular. Did he really think that that was what was really going on in the sky? Yes. He did. Um, okay. You have it. You have a. It's interesting because there is a cosmology. Um, from uh, Ptolemaeus, from Ptolemy, I think you say. Um, I prefer the German uh, Latin version, Ptolemaeus. Um, there is a method in which he, he embeds the epicycle different models in, in spheres. Um, and this appears in the work of Poyerbach. When at least everybody thought originally Poyerbach is of 15th century. Um, most in, one of the two most important 15th century astronomers. And everybody thought this was original to Poyerbach, but it turns out to be, um, there is a one, which was discovered in the 1960s, one Arabic um, manuscript of uh, Ptolemaeus' cosmology. And this is exactly the model that's in there. So obviously Poyerbach had one. Um, um, and if you actually read Ptolemy, it's always said that Ptolemy is just a sort of mathematical models and it's not the truth. But if you actually read um, his, his, his big, um, what is called in, in English, the Almagest, uh, Syntaxis Mathematici, um, he actually believes in his model, it's real. 
Yeah. Um, people ignore this and say, no, 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 no. It, it's, it's just a mathematical model. Um, and they, they say that he's an Aristotelian. He's not. Um, Ptolemy has a very interesting mathematical philosophy, which, which um, gets ignored. Um, there are a couple of very good books on it, but they're, they're very technical. Um, so we won't go into that. Um, so you've got, you got this model, um, and there are competing models. This is the next point. Yeah. Um, you, have a, you have in the um, 16th century, you have a return to the um, Aristotelian homocentric model. Uh, with uh, Fra Castoro, who is, who is an important figure. He's a physician and an astronomer, astrologer. Um, he's the guy who, who actually gave syphilis its name. Um, no, he's, he's, he's an interesting historical figure. Yeah. And he, he out purity, he, he rejects the Ptolemaic model and says, we've got to go back to um, Aristotelian homocentricity. It's, it's, it's purity. It's back to the cosmology. You know, like sort of... And, when Clavius is writing his um, Sphera, which became the most important uh, teaching book on, on astronomy at the end of the 16th century, he regards uh, Fra Castoro as, as a far more serious uh, opponent than Copernicus. Um, yeah, you know, like, so <laughs> this is, you also still have, uh, there's, a, there's a model from, uh, which first appears in the work of uh, Martianus Capella in the, in the fifth century. Um, in which um, Venus and Mercury um, orbit the sun and the sun orbits the earth with the rest of the planets. Um, this is often false, uh, called the Egyptian model or the Heraclidian model. Uh, it had not, Her Heraclitus had nothing to do with it. Um, it's, it's, um, and the way that uh, Capella talks about it is obviously not new. So there, there, are, there were previous people who had this. And this model is actually very, very popular in the Middle Ages. And it's very logical because if you, if you look at it, Mercury and, and, and Venus never go very far away from the sun, which is why you have this phenomenon with, with Venus as the morning star and the evening star. It depends on which side of the sun it is because it orbits the sun. Yeah? And it, it very obviously orbits the sun. And Mercury, which is inside the orbit of, of, of Venus, but not so good to see, also very obviously orbits the sun. And people realise this very early on. And so you have this, this alternative, um, the Capellan model. Um, you also have, um, going doing the rounds all the way through, you have, you have a Heraclidian model, which is, which is basically a, a normal geocentric model, except for the Earth has the owner rotation. It moves. It rotates. And this was also discussed, in, particularly in the Middle Ages, um, Lots of the leading Middle Age uh, medieval uh, philosophers discussed this model and all said it's much more rational that the Earth rotates and not the, the sphere of the stars, which is enormous. Yeah. And then said, but convention or tradition dictates its others, so we won't use it. So, uh, so you have people uh, like uh, uh, was it Arisme, Arisme, Arisme and, and Buridan, uh, or a couple of Buridan and so, they're, all, they're all looking at this and sort of yeah. rejecting it, uh, but rejecting it on, 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 on sort of traditional grounds, not on, on, on physical grounds. On physical grounds, they accept it as being a much more rational model. So the, the convention that there is sort of geocentric astronomy on the one side, heliocentric on the other, um, it's far too simplistic. Is that misapprehension of a dichotomy, is that due to Galileo? Because Galileo... No, it's, it's, it precedes... Pre 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 it, it goes back several hundred years. You're talking about a, you're talking about a development which goes over a period of two hundred years. You're talking about um, uh, but I, I was uh, thinking, sorry, sorry, Tony, um, but I was thinking of the fact that when Galileo wrote his dialogue, it was a dialogue. It, it was between two world systems. He ignored all those other alternatives. He, he doesn't talk about the Tychonian yeah, system. He doesn't talk about any of the ones he just talked about. He actually bullshits. <laughs> Uh, because when, when he wrote when he wrote the Dialogo, both of the systems he discussed had been abandoned. <laughs> um, right, the systems. What he should have been talking about would have been a Tychonic system, in which all the planets go around the sun and the sun goes around the Earth, yep. with or without Dion or rotation. There are two different models, or um, a Keplerian model, and. The two systems that he discusses were both obsolete by the time he discusses them. So he's setting up he's setting up a, a polemic, which is completely which is complete bullshit. You know, I mean, it's, it's sort of it's, it's it's Galileo at his most polemic uh, 
I'm going to be right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. Um, We're getting a little so, ahead of ourselves because that was, main, sorry, sorry, I introduced that because that was yeah. like that's but main, thirties. We're not that mainstream. Far. Mainstream. Mainstream was. Mainstream was we have a Ptolemaic um, geocentric system and. We have as major competitor at the beginning, but not taken very seriously by anybody really, um, Copernicus heliocentric system. Um, then the Tychonic system gets introduced by Tycho Brahe, but he's not the only one. There's a whole series of people who come up with this model uh, based on, on a modification of a Copernican system and thinking about the um, Capellan system. They start with the Capellan system and say, well, what if all the planets orbit the sun? And it's, 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 it's a natural next step. Um, and Tycho is not the only person who does this. There are, there are quite a few of them. Um, but he, he, it's, it's one of the fascinating things about this whole story is that it's whoever publishes gets the credit, you know, like sort of, Publish or perish, you know, it's, 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 it's not different in modern um, things. So like we've got Tycho's system and we've got Copernicus's system. And then, then along comes Kepler. And Kepler in 1608, no, 1609, publishes his astronomy Nova, um, in which he produces the first of his two planetary uh, laws. Uh, that the orbits are in fact ellipses and that the earth is at the focal point of, uh, no, the sun rather, is, is at the focal point of, of, of the ellipse. Yep. Um, he actually only proves it for Mars, uh, but assumes it for all planets. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, never, he, never, he never actually bothers to, to, to do the work to on do the, rest. the rest. But can I go back to a point you just, made, just touched on, because I think this is very important. You said... Barely anyone paid, or barely anyone took Copernicus seriously. And if you read a lot of popular modern uh, discourse on this, you would think that it was like evolution versus creation, that, that on one side you had the scientists and they all believed in Copernicanism, and on the other side you had the superstitious, stupid Catholics, uh, you know, the, the, the Inquisition and so on, who, who, who rejected it and believed in, in the Ptolemaic system. But it was nothing like that. Um, so going back to your point, you know, my understanding is that there was only a handful of scholars who accepted Copernicanism at the beginning of the 17th century. So at the time um, that Galileo first started to get into trouble, there, were, there was barely almost, anyone who actually accepted it. It's almost, uh, if you go up to 1600, there's a famous footnote from uh, Robert Westman that there are only 10 Copernicans in, in the world between in uh, 1543, when De Revolutionibus was published in Nuremberg, which is down the road from where I'm sitting now, yeah. um, the house is still there. Um, I can see it on my blog. It's, it's, it's actually what my blog banner is. It's, it's, it's this oh, house one. where the, uh, De Revolutionibus was printed. Yeah. Um, Robert Westman says there are 10 uh, Copernicans in the world uh, between uh, 1543 and 1600. Um, there are actually a couple more um he misses he misses some um but there is actually a modern modern research if you really go into it there's a very wide spectrum of people accepting bits of copernicus um as accepting aspects of it um discussing rejecting discussing um and so forth um there's there's a very good Book by Odomeo, uh, Pietro Odomeo, which goes into uh, all of this, um, which I highly recommend. Um, I've, I've, <laughs> I've read it; it's a great book, and I, I think you might you might not recall, but on my blog, you and I had a debate with a commenter who was taking issue with me over this, and you, you very kindly came in in my support, quoting both <laughs> Westman and Odomeo, saying, "Look, he, here they are." Like I think we came up with a total of maybe twelve. But one yeah. of those actually changed his mind. So it's kind of like 11. No, but it's um, this sort of... It's the answer sort of, is, the point is barely any, barely anyone actually accepted. Uh, accepted um, they found it, they, people found it an interesting uh, mathematical model. Um, and one of the things that, that did happen was, was um, the planet, we need to go back, uh, all the way back to, to, to Ptolemy. 
astronomy. What is the purpose of astronomy? The astronomy is, a, a, we said his, his, his models work. The purpose of astronomy is to say where planets are at a given point in time. And the usage there for that is astrology. You also need it for navigation. You need it for cartography and so forth. So astronomy is actually a sub-discipline which provides data for other academic disciplines. And the tables that were based on Ptolemy were incredibly inaccurate because like Ptolemaic tables had been copied from manuscript to manuscript to manuscript over 2000 years, um, which meant they had a lot of errors in them. They were never very accurate in the first place. Uh, they were accurate okay, but you know, and they got worse and worse. And so the reform, and this is one of the things that was going on, and this is where Copernicus first got into it. The reform is to try and get better tables. Uh, the first people to do this um, are sort of um, Regan Montanus and Poyabach in, in, in the 16th century. And Copernicus learned his astronomy from the, from the textbooks of Poyabach, uh, which uh, one of which uh, Regan Montanus published. Um, he set up the first scientific printing press. So like the, the, this process has been going on for about 200 years. And what, what, really, what the people are really into is getting more accurate astronomy. And the principal drive behind that is in order to get more accurate astrology. Um, so that is sort of, and they're all, I mean, Kepler is, a, is an astrologer, Galileo is an astrologer. Um, Copernicus is, 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 is the notable exception. Um, he does some minor astro astrological stuff. He interprets a couple of uh, horoscopes of people. He's a doctor. He's a physician. That he does uh, some of his stuff he does as a physician is very obvious uh, astrological medicine. Uh, which is the mainstream medicine at the time. Um, so they will, what, what the main interest in, in, in this is, is not in models of explaining the, the universe or anything else. It's getting data. And people hoped that Copernicus, because he had a new mathematical model, would deliver better data than the Ptolemaic model. So people were using it instrumentally. Uh, um, it's what Westman, uh, not West, you know, is it Westman, uh, calls the, the, um, uh, Indrich, Indrich, right? Uh, Wittenberg model. Yeah. No, no, but, uh, uh, Westman calls it the, the, the Wittenberg model because they, oh, they're using it instrumentally. Yeah. And people, people choose, produce so called ephemerides, uh, based on Copernicus. And it turns out they're just as inaccurate as the ones from, because they're using the same basic data. Um, and this is where this is where um, Regan Montanus um, in the 15th century set up a, a, a program to get new basic data. And unfortunately, he died before he could even get going. And the project got forgotten. Um, and this is where Tycho Brahe comes in. Tycho Brahe is a uh, um, Danish aristocrat who's interested in astronomy, mathematics. And he wants to uh, observe um, a solar eclipse or something and realizes all of the tables, depending on whether they're Copernican or Ptolemaic, are both completely inaccurate. So he, he sets up his life's aim is to produce new data, to produce new tables. And this is exactly what he does. He spends 30 years producing astronomical data that is on several factors more accurate than anything the Greeks ever produced, oh. vast amounts of it. Um, and at the end of his life, uh, although it, he didn't intend it to be the end of his life, at the end of his life, he employs uh, Kepler um, to turn this data into a um, astronomical model. And he wants him to turn it into his Ticonic model and gets him to give a, a deathbed uh, promise that he'll do this. And Kepler does exactly the opposite. He turns it into the Copernic uh, into the Keplerian model. And what what is important? Um, this th is quite a quite an interesting thing, uh, mathematical scientific thing. Um, for the mathematical tools that Kepler is using, the accuracy that um, Tycho had produced is adequate. But if it be more accurate or less accurate, 
Kepler wouldn't have been able to derive his model from it. Um, it's if he'd been more accurate, because they're not actually ellipses, they're, they're sort of <laughs> fucked ellipses, you know. Like, so, <laughs> and because it, it had Gnell the right, it had exactly the right level of accuracy that Kepler could deduce that the orbit of Mars is an ellipse. Yeah. It took him, it took him six years to do so. Um, and he basically he kept backtracking. Um, he actually came up with a model which wasn't an ellipse, but um, which was much more accurate than anything that had ever been produced before. But he said it was it didn't do justice to the accuracy of Tycho's observations. So he started from scratch again. <laughs> Kepler is, in, is a bulldog. I mean, yeah. Incredible. People don't realize Kepler wrote 83 books and pamphlets in his life, wrote and published. Wow. I mean, you learn at school, you, all you learn at school is, is Kepler, three planetary cassettes, uh, laws, and that's it. Yeah, like, so this guy is, this guy is, I, if anybody is the father of modern science, it's Kepler. It's not Galileo. He did far I've, more than Galileo ever did. I've often, I've often said that, that, you know, one of the worst things about the popular myths about Galileo is that it edges Kepler out of the story. Kepler was the only right. guy who got it right. I mean, close to it. <laughs> and, and you, you never um, hear about him. It's ridiculous. And Galileo completely ignored him. It's, it's absolutely yeah. ludicrous. Yeah, because well, Galileo, doesn't, Galileo doesn't want to share the credit with anybody. <laughs> uh, no, this is... This is this is the yeah, this yeah. is the very important point. Very, very Galileo has yeah. Galileo, Galileo has the has has the ego of an of, of, of an out of control Arctic truck, um, and he is not prepared to share credit with anybody on any level whatsoever. Well, that brings us to the end of part one of my conversation with Tony Christie. In part two, we will take up the story of Galileo's sudden rise to fame and the first controversy about his teaching of the Copernican model as fact. So I'd encourage you to check that out next. See you again here soon.